earning boxes. If you look around the room, starting with the sugar bowl back there, and some, you'll find these little lidded boxes all over the place. Peter makes them. A lot of, a lot of people make them. Uh, there's all kinds of different ways to make them. Uh, what I'm going to talk about today with the lidded boxes is, is going to be the, uh, the type of lidded box that uh, Richard Raffin has, has teaches. And he had in his first book, Turning Wood, uh, published in a couple, of, uh, a couple of different publishers, he has this little box here. And it's uh, pretty easy. If you turn it upside down, the lid falls off. Um, the, way that, the way that this is turned is you start off with a piece of wood, this piece of wood here. You screw truck it or you, you somehow fix it. You turn the bottom of the, of the bowl and you put a, a recess in it and you finish it. And now you turn it around, grab, grab it this way, hollow out this, make all this detail and finish the inside of it. And then you have the lid piece, which has a tenon that sits here. And basically you chuck it up and then you do the inside of this to start with. And you make this little groove here to fit here like that. So you get a good fit. And then after you've done the fit and you've finished the inside of this, now you've got a groove in here where you can grab the lidded box and you can uh, uh, hold it. And now you can do the outside of the box. And the nice thing about this is, is that you can take it out of the chuck, put it on the base. And if you don't like the look of it, you can change it. And you can keep on doing that. And then when you get through, you put the finish on the outside. And then you've got, so you've got this lidded box. Uh, that's a good way to do things. Uh, you make big stuff that way. You can do all kinds. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about a suction fit box. And the difference between this type of lidded box and a suction fit box is if I put the lid on this box and turn it upside down, the lid doesn't come off. Okay. Here's another one, uh, a little looser fit, but still the same consequence. Whoop. Almost. This is called a loose suction fit. Yeah, it, it, it will hold, but just barely. Uh, so uh, that's what I'm going to talk about. Um, I've got a handout for you. Uh, it's uh, There's uh, 50 ways to leave a lover, but there's 26 steps in making a lidded box this way. So we're going to start down through uh, the 26 steps. And uh, but I do want to first flip to the third page. That's this page that talks about the different types of lid fit, where you've got uh, the one at the top is, uh, is something we're going to do today, where we have a one, one degree taper on the on the uh, to get a jam fit. Uh, we're there's a piston fit where both of the insides are parallel to each other, and it fits. Uh, it, it's a cylindrical flange, lid flange over a cylindrical base flange. We'll learn how to make the, the cylinders. And then we have the suction fit, which has a slight curve to it, and that's really the secret on the base flange to getting a nice fit where the box can be turned upside down and the lid will stay on. Okay. Um, now, uh, let's see. Uh, book. This is the book, Turning Boxes by Richard Raffin, where he goes into a lot of detail about doing all different kinds of boxes and putting uh, screw threads on them and all kinds of things. If you haven't got a copy of it, um, the club did have a copy of this at one time. I came across a reference to it, but I couldn't find it in the library this time. Perhaps. So I, Somebody's got it at home. But anyway, uh, yep. Um, okay, uh, the tools, roughing gouge, um, I like big roughing gouges, these take away the wood very nicely and you don't get much vibration from them, and so big roughing gouge is good, um, the, uh, square end scraper, is uh, another thing that's essential to doing this. these boxes. You can't do a box like this without the square end scraper. This happens to be a square end scraper that's called a Badan tool. It's got a trapezoidal profile to it. Uh, I, I hope it, is everybody familiar with a Badan tool? Uh, 
very useful. Um, as a matter of fact, I find I use it more than almost anything else. This is a trapezoidal shape. I would not get the square. It, it binds and it's not nearly as useful as this is. Uh, inside calipers. All right, put them up here because that's where I'm going to use them. Uh, these calipers are standard calipers, except these edges have been rounded out with a file so I don't make marks on my wood. And they're essential. You can't make this a box without, a, without those. There are some workarounds, and I'll talk about those as we go through it. Uh, need a, a spindle gouge. I've got one that's uh, uh, it's my detail gouge. It's a variation on what Cindy Drosdale uses. Uh, it's got no uh, heel to it, or at least not much of a heel. Uh, so I can get into real small places with it without any trouble. Uh, a round nose scraper. Uh, this is my kind of go-to uh, negative rate scraper. It's heavy, it's thick, it's got a, uh, a round nose to it. Um, okay. Yes, sir. Yes. Carbide. Yeah. If you had a square carbide insert, would not substitute for this. I haven't used them, so I don't know. Light <laughs> radius on it, not quite, but the square, like the easy yeah, wood you, twirl, will you work. You need a square, okay? And that's essential because only with with the square, it's the only way I know to get a true cylinder when you're doing the lids. And it's also essential. When you're making the hot, get good sidewalls, the square scraper. I mean, I can use a, a regular tool uh, that the club has. The square scrapers that we have with the club. It's just not, it's just not as thick, not as stable what the damp tool is, and it doesn't have the relief on the sides like this does. Okay. Um, so I use a bowl gouge for lots of stuff, and I also have, uh, and this is a Full gas with, uh, with the uh, David Ellsworth grind on it. Uh, there are a lot of different grinds you can use. I'm not recommending Ellsworth grind over any, any other grind that you're used to. Uh, I also use the 4040 grind that Stuart Batty uh, has. And I found that with the 4040 grind, I can get uh, the surface of the, of the wood very, very smooth, almost as good as I can when I've got a skew chisel. Uh, I don't use a skew chisel for a lidded box in the way that people normally use skew chisels, I use a negative rate scraper to do some of the fine work that needs to be done with these wooded boxes. Um, and then I've got fat fingers. When you do little boxes like this one, my fat fingers don't fit in there with the sandpaper very well. So I got a hemostat and a piece of sandpaper. It makes it so much easier to sand the inside of these boxes, both uh, the Follow up here in the lid as well as the, as the base. So, uh, absolutely. The, the, the way you hold a hemostat is this way. You don't ever hold your hemostat this way. And that's, yeah, as a matter of fact, in surgeries, that's the way they hold a hemostat. So, it's, uh, the, the, I don't know why they put these things on there because I can open them up, you know. Pretty, pretty easily, but I think it's just so that they would have a way to, to manipulate them if they needed to, the nurse can manipulate them. But a surgeon, when he goes in with a hemostat, he just grabs them and pushes them together, and that's, that's the way it's done. Um, yes. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, so we've talked tools, we've talked lid box concepts. Um, this is a block of wood that I started with. If you want me to turn it around and part it in the middle, I would and put oh turn it around, put tenons on the ends, and then part it in, in the middle. I've done that to save a little time uh, and to make it easier for you. Um, Richard Raffin says he used uh, eighth inch tenons on it. Uh, three sixteenths is a whole lot better. Uh, the the real critical thing though is to have a good shoulder. So that when you put it in the chuck, it's it's in the chuck. 
Okay. So the first step it says here is mount the lid bank and turn it true. Okay, um, putting stuff in chucks. I have a uh, dovetail jaws on this particular chuck. And I like the dovetails a whole lot better than I like the serrated. Uh, serrated are good if, um, if, if that's what you like. But what I find is that I have trouble getting the serrated uh, jaws to grip the wood uh, with the shoulder tightly up against the, 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 uh, the, the, uh, the jaws of the chuck. So, and, oops, oh. There we go. And what I like to do before I tighten the jaws of the chuck is I like to put bring the tailstock up and put some pressure on the on the uh, piece of wood here so that I've got no gap whatsoever between the jaws and the piece of wood that I have. There. And this particular Vicmark chuck is a very good, but you still need to tighten chucks every place there's a place you tighten to make sure the jaws are evenly uh, tensioned against the wood. Okay, so we've got the wood in in here, and it's a little stubby piece. And now we're going to start this thing. Put on my head here. Can you hear me talk now? Good. Okay, nothing's happened. So we turn this up. With this size of uh, piece in here, I like to I like to go about twelve hundred RPM, thirteen hundred RPM. Now my tool rest is a little ways away from that, so I need to start the machine, bring my tool rest up, and what we're going to do is we're just going to make sure that we've got a cylinder here. It's a bowl gouge. This happens to be a 40-40 bowl, bowl gouge, but that tells working to do the same job. All I want to do is just make sure it's round and it doesn't have to be perfectly round or perfectly smooth. It just needs to be round. And the reason for that is, is because what I'm going to do now is I'm going to haul out this upper uh, upper part of the, uh, the lid. Um, yeah, it's a spindle. Yes, you don't. You, in, with in green boxes, uh, I have found that if you have a fifth in the in the box, it makes it a whole lot harder uh, to to keep it round. The tangential shrinkage on a, on a, on the on the limb around the fifth or create distortions. And so you want to have basically uh, side grain uh, to make your box work. You can do it. it you're going to have to have a twice turned box because the, it's going to distort on you and you're going to need to, to, to uh, turn it again after, after it's distorted. This is kiln dried brown wood. I don't know what kind of wood it is. It's a piece of wood that Dale Winburn gave me. <laughs> and it's brown wood. <laughs> okay. Now, if people can see this, my tool rest is too high. It's my, the, the tool cutting surface is about a quarter inch above the center, and that's not good. What you want to do is make sure that you put your tool rest at a point where you are at center or slightly below center, at least that's what works for me for most of the stuff. Uh, at center is the best. Okay, so I'm at center now. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna hollow out this lid, but not all the way because I need to leave the uh, lid flange, space for the lid flange. So we turn this up.
Now, when I'm cutting in this and it starts to vibrate, that means I'm putting too much pressure on it. And that causes that pressure that I'm putting on there echoes against the wood and causes the chatter. So what I want to do is I can make some pretty coarse cuts. But when I get to my final cuts, I want to make them light. I don't want to put a lot of pressure on there. about that there's a hole one of the things I've learned in the last couple of three years is that these scrapers are really good for doing finish cuts so all you have to do is just come in on the level Okay, that's ready for 200 grit sandpaper. That's the advantage of a round nose scraper. Okay, so now we've rough hollowed the lid. So now we're going to cut the lid flange. Okay, so if I try to cut this flange with the tool right at center. I'm going to catch both the top edge and the bottom edge of the tool. Yeah. So when I cut this flange, I want to make sure that the, this bottom edge of, can come in contact with the sidewalls. So what I've got to do is I've got to have it well above center. And that's what I'm talking about when I say that the tool rests at center so the tool cuts above the center. And this is important because what we're doing is we're making a very circular flange in here. So it's perfectly circular. If I take the uh, calipers and I put the calipers in the flange like this, and I've got it at the bottom of the flange now, and I pull the calipers out, that's a constant pressure on my part to pull it out. And the legs really don't move at all when I go in and out. And that tells me that this is a perfectly circular. If it, if it tapers in at the top or if it, ta if it tapers in at the bottom, that's not going to give you the kind of kind of uh, fit that you want, uh, both for the jam and for the, uh, the suction fit at the end. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and make the, uh, the cut on the flange. That right there. Okay. Now I had this set up so that it's right at dead center. And now what I need to do is I need to raise it so it's above center. That's what I've done. I've got the banana tool. I notice that the banana tool is a scraper, so the handle is high. Boy, that was hard to make. Um, yeah. Why is it necessary for the cutting tool to be above center when it cuts? And the answer to that is, is that if it's at center, the, uh, the, the, the top of the, the See, this is round. Center is the widest part. If I have the tool at center, what's going to happen to the bottom of the tool here, this, this corner that's here? 
it's going to cut into the into the into the into the form. So what I have to do is I have to raise the whole tool so that the bottom of the tool is at center, and then and then this this tool is cutting above center and to make it exactly parallel. Okay. okay. So um, we did the. Okay, uniformly cylindrical. That's what we got to do now is to check. I keep looking at Peter's clock and it stops. Oh, it's the most accurate clock in the world. It tells you the exact time twice a day. Okay, so what I'm doing right now is I'm checking to make sure this is a sentence. <laughs> that never happens. First try. It never happens. Anyway, it's it's parallel now. No, sir. I can guarantee you that this is the very first time I have heard about this. And I've probably 45 or 50 of these lids. So this is not. I don't know. It's baffling. It really is. Okay. The, at this time, I've got the flange in about a, a quarter of an inch. And one of the things that you have to make sure of is that the flange on the lid, this inside, is going to be taller than this part of the, of the flange on the base. So that when they fit together, they don't go bottom out. Okay. Um, yeah, that looks about right. We'll just make the flange on the bottom. No, I'm going to make it a little deeper. Because it, huh? nah, we'll see. We'll see. That should just be an extension of what I've got. No, it's a little too tight up at the top. Tapered at the top, so I've got to reduce that. Okay. Absolutely. Being fussy at this stage in the game is important um, because this is the secret to getting that suction fit. This isn't fit in right. You'll never get the suction fit. I'm good with that. Okay. Now, it's better to be a little too deep than it is to be too shallow. And that's why I made the second cut on there, even though it took an extra few minutes to do. Okay. So now that you've got the flange in there, you can go ahead and finish sanding it and finish the inside. Uh, I'm not going to do that. Just, just save, save a little time. Uh, but we'll see at the end how it, how it works out. Um, so that's that. Oh, yes. While you've got the thing chucked up, I like to go ahead and put some shape this. Uh, when this gets turned around and jam fitted to the base, uh, you're not going to have as secure an attachment that you have right now. And so if you want to hog out some, remove some wood, now's the time to take care of that. So that's what I'm going to do now. Old gadget again. Okay, well now we want to be back on center, and we are, with our tool.
How's that? Okay. Oh, that was the other thing that I forgot to do. You notice that I leave the, the lip on here? And the reason I leave the lip on here is when you forget to do something, you need to be able to get back in. Huh? So, and the other thing is, is that it's uh, sometimes... Um, what I didn't do is this rim is, is perfectly smooth because I did that before. But the problem is, is that this, the, when you fit the when you fit the lid to the to the rest of the box, go over here to the last last page. It really helps if you have a angle on the uh, on the on the lid rim that is slightly tapered inward, and that makes that that join a whole lot easier. If it's square, sometimes you don't get the flange on the on the base exactly square. And what you want is you want a, a, a slight angle here, as in the lower left-hand detail. And you'll see that that detail is is in most of the other ways to join up the lid to the base. So that's what I'm going to do. Is I'm just going to make that transition. And to do that, I use a skew as a scraper, as a negative rate scraper. You could use the bedan tool too. It, it really doesn't make a bit of difference. I still want to pass that around. You can see how I've done that. Just, just a little bit on the inside. Okay. Now, face flange. There it is. Again, I go through the same process, bringing up the tail stocks. Now, because you've got a little bit of uh, a little bit of distance on this, you could leave the tail stock up, or you can take it away. I'm going to take it away. I used my 4040 gauge on the uh, on the lid, and so I'll demonstrate with the regular bowl gauge, Goldsmith style, just to show you that there's no difference really. Okay, again, we want to be right at center. We need to lift this just a tiny bit. We're still at about 1200 RPM. I've got some wobble in there and I'm not sure why I've got wobble. I know why I've got wobble. Because I didn't get this tightened up like I should have. That's one of the advantages of, as you work through your way through this stuff, one of the advantages of, uh, of doing things repetitively yeah, there are two reasons. <laughs> I've got a nub here that I need to get rid of. Uh, 
How do you get rid of nubs? Use the skew. One of the things that a lot of people don't pay attention to is little details like that wobble that I saw in here. And I've trained myself to stop anytime there's something that, I, that isn't expected. Stop, shut the thing off, figure out what the heck is not going right. And you've got to do that. If you hear a noise that you haven't heard before, if you see something that just doesn't look right, Stop and fix it. Otherwise, you wind up with bloody fingers. Okay. Now we've got this at center. <laughs> okay. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're just going to make this thing round. When I'm making this, these moves, the lid piece was real short. So you probably didn't notice that I used my entire body to use that. But anytime that you're moving it, what you want to do is figure out where you're going to be at the end, make sure you're comfortable, back yourself up, and then come back. So you start uncomfortable, you wind up comfortable at the end. Okay? So it's round. It doesn't have to be smooth at this point because we're going to be doing the after we get everything put together then we'll be doing the shaping of it okay so now what we want to do is figure out how uh did my piece come back yet okay Good. now the base flange this thing is going to fit on the base flange that's here. And what we have to do is we have to size this, size this base flange to fit inside this fit. And the first fit we do is a jam fit so that I can jam this on. And now I can go ahead and detail this little bit in here so that I have a good solid fit. And I can also finish turning the top of my lid. Before we do that, though, I'm going to go ahead, take the flange, and put the uh, and, and hollow this thing out, and the depth that it needs to be. So to make the flange, we turn to our back to our trusty old square scraper, and what I want to do here is I want to make the flange a little less deep than this piece is. So that's what I'm going to do. Okay, my flange here is almost exactly the camera that I need to fit inside here. So what I'm done doing with the flange is I'm tapering it. So that this inside diameter here is smaller than the outside diameter. And the reason I'm doing that is because I want to sneak up on the, the actual diameter that I'm going to use in the future. 
So I turn it off. I put this over. Oh, look at that. Look at that. So what I just did was I put a burnish mark on there. Okay. And so I know that this lid is gonna is gonna fit on the flange. And in fact, if I have misjudged and made this flange a little too narrow here, I can always add a little bit more to it and then take this off. So I'm gonna sneak up on it. I'm gonna make this flange a little bit longer because I undercut here a little bit too much. So we'll give ourselves just an extra measure. And you can see how nicely this bedan tool cut it really makes it easy to do to do that. Okay. Okay, so now it's time to hollow this thing out. It's basically the same drill as what we did with the lid. And I want to make sure that I'm at center. jabber out of the way. Okay, it's getting a little deep for me to be using this tool because it's such a big tool. So. Sure. And you can use these things to drill holes. Did you know that? Okay, we're almost to the bottom, or where I want the bottom to be. Now you've got a, the question is, what are you gonna do with the bottom? Uh, as you saw with the top, all we did was we just made a little dome on the top. But the bottom offers you two or three different ways to, to do the bottom. In this case, I just did a dome on the bottom. In this case, I did a square on the bottom. And I kind of think a square would be better on this box, so we'll try it. We'll try it. So we're doing squares. Yeah, okay. 
So the next thing we need is the bedan tool again, because the bedan tool is the tool that can make that bottom real nice and square without any trouble. And again, as we go to cut, we want to make sure that we're above center with the tool so that we don't get any interference. Now, if we want to get that bottom really smooth, we uh, tool rest just a little bit so we get the tool in the scraping position. Now we can go across. Yeah, how is that going to work, huh? Got a little a little nubbin down in there that I want to get out. Okay. There we are. Okay, so we're down the list now to the base flange. Uh, okay, we're ready to do, oh, that's that's what we gotta do, make the bottom plenty thick. We're on, um, on number 12, we're marking the exact internal depth. So how do we do that? Mark the exact internal depth. That's really easy. Huh? I've got a tool right here. My thumb and my pencil. It works. Okay. Uh, the reason we're doing this right now, and the reason why I haven't gone deeper in this box is because if I wanted to go deeper, it's going to take a lot, a lot longer time to do that, and the technique is the same. Um, one of the things that I've found with making these boxes is that you want a box that's got a fairly thick bottom to it, because these boxes tend to have a relatively small base, and the thicker you have the, uh, the base, the more weight they have. That's why we're making sure we know where the bottom is. Okay, so this is my bottom. I want to move over at least a quarter inch to make my parting cut. And the reason why I do this is because I want to have a piece of wood here that I can use for as a jam chuck later on. So we're just doing a little work here to get this thing looking right. What? No. <laughs> Richard Rappin figured this out. I didn't. <laughs> Okay. 
That was not smart. <laughs> That was not smart. Now, let's go. Um, Nick Cook's thin parting tool. You need to do two widths of it as you, as you, as you push it in. Otherwise, it'll get jammed up. And when this thing gets jammed up because it's got such a broad area here, it tends to slam down on the tool rest. And when it slams down on the tool rest because it's jammed, now all of a sudden you've got a bent tool. Ask me on. Okay. Okay. So I made it. Okay. So we're now we're going to sand and finish, polish and finish the inside of the base. Except I'm not going to do that. Okay. We want to fit the lid on tight. That's what we're about to do now. And to do that, I need my good old banana tool. There it is. Put this on. Oh, yeah, that's going to be nice. Okay, so I've got a good burnish mark there, so I know exactly what the diameter is of this. So I can now sneak up on a good jam. This will take some time. And do not uh, make your jam fit uh, crooked. See how it's sneaking up on it? Now this is now about a sixteenth of an inch further in. But I've still got this burnish mark here. Ooh, what's that out here? Uh, we, you don't sand this surface. This is not a surface that's sand. The, the question that I had as I just thought about this is that this flat interior flange is longer than this. So I need to reduce this flange there are two ways you can. What I'm doing is I'm taking off about a, uh, a little more than a sixteenth of an inch off this plan. So that I have a good, so that it won't interfere with this part of it. And what I just did there was to break the edge so that it's not a sharp edge here. Okay, so now we're back to jam fitting. Now, resist the temptation to knock this thing on. Uh, because it'll split this this part, and then you have to go back and make another one. Uh, the other thing is, is that when I was making that little box, I actually got to fit too tight, and what I finally had to do was to use my detail gouge to get enough uh, area to grab to get the two apart after I had done my jam. So. I like to think that I'm doing the jam fit by 1 28th of an inch, not a 64th of an inch, but a 1 28th. See how it's, it's, I'm sneaking up on it?
almost there. This is the part where it really mess up because what is it'll be almost impossible to get it apart uh, after you've done done your your work. So, lesson to be learned. Yeah, I'm down now to where I've got a little less than a sixteenth of an inch to go. And this is where you get really light with the touch. What I'm doing is I'm looking down on this as I'm watching where the, the uh, shavings are coming off. And what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to work in that sixteenth of an inch that I had there as a gap. So that now I can put this thing on. Still got a little ways to go, which is what you want to do. Don't want to try to do this fast. Because you, you're going you're gonna to make a mistake uh, and you're, you have to repeat a lot of work. Yeah, I thought about going ahead and uh, making up, you know, extra caps and stuff. So I could show you how, how this does. Okay, I'm halfway there now. But see how much effort I'm having to do to pull that sucker off? That should be it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this particular, well, this particular method is not, is not very good for that because you're taking off. Uh, by the time you get the lid to the flange here, you're, 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 in a, you're a quarter inch or better of lost wood and you can't make that up. So there's other techniques that you could use where you have a ring inside here. And wood, and all you're taking out of the wood is just the parting tool. So you have the lid with a recess in it for the for the ring, or the the, uh, the base has a recess. In it. And that's the technique you use for that. You know, when you're doing this, think of it as at least five or ten trips back and forth to get this get this bit right. You just can't do it. Bam, done. <laughs> and when it's down as close as I've got it right now, there we go. I just this is <laughs> take it off and make sure you can take it off because if it gets jammed it, it takes a little bit of effort to get it. there we go that's the bit we want that's the bit we want see how it goes on and stays on Now I can pull it off. Now I can pull it off. <laughs> okay. The good news is that we've got a dimple right here, so I can bring up the tailstock. And anytime you're working with a jam chuck, it's always a good idea to be able to bring up the tailstock. What else do we need, Jeff? Jeff? Okay, everybody see how tight that is? That's a good fit. I've checked to make sure I, I can pull it off as well as put it back on again. I brought up the tailstock, so now I've got a good effort there. Uh, so it's fit. We've got a good jam. 
Okay, so now we are at the point where we need to uh, roughly finish shape the lid profile, detail the join and refine the profile, and finish turning the profile of the box. Okay, that's what we're going to do. Okay, and to do that, Okay. So this is the bottom of the box. This is the lid. The lid is going to end right about here. So we're going to waste away a bunch of wood and get it ready to, to do the, the detail of work going right. Now remember that the lid has got a, a, a slope on the inside. Of the lid. So that will keep us with a tight fit against the base. Okay. So a bowl gouge. So we want to get rid of a lot of wood. Don, have I been doing good on safety? Don is our safety master here because he belongs to the Virginia, Central Virginia wood turners, and they have very strict safety rules. Decision time. You want to have a little video like that or a little bit top like that or you want something different? Huh? Now it's time for the detail gas. Oh, did you all see how nicely that this 4040 gouge came in and made the finish on this? It's a nice, very smooth, not much in the way of tool mark kind of thing. And you saw how fast it was. It's really good. Okay, so we're going to bake that stuff. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, um, now what I want to do is I've got the top kind of mapped out. I've done the, what I call the preliminaries. Now, since I've got the tailstock, if I go ahead and finish this off, then I don't have the tailstock to keep everything together. So I want to keep everything together as I go ahead and put the start to shape up the box. Okay, so now we know where the lid's going to join right here. It's almost invisible to see, so we want to make, a, make it look pretty. So we're going to take off a little bit more with this gouge. Hmm. Okay. <laughs> well, now we have a washer and a lid. <laughs> Okay. Uh, no, glue won't fix this. <laughs> Guarantee. Okay, so let me go ahead and show you how I'm going to finish this bottom. And um, well, the first thing that we're going to do on this. Is that I make this transition right here round so that I have a slight curve. If you can see it on this box, you can see a slight curve on here. And so that's what I'm going to make. It's a slight curve. And then what I would do is after I've got that slight curve is I would slowly reduce that till I got a nice fit right here, a nice suction fit right here. And that would be the end of that part of what we're, what we're doing. So I apologize for making the ring. Okay, so the next thing to do is to part off this, yeah, part off the base. Part. Yeah. <laughs>
Now we're making a jam chuck here. The procedure for doing this jam truck is exactly the same as we did when we took the lid to bait plan. What I've got is I've got this thing tapered just a little bit. Can, but my experience with this is that when you've got a interior of your, of your surface is really round, then that works really well. If you've got a bowl or something like that where you've got end grain, side grain, and you've got relatively large diameters, then what you're talking about works even be works better. Because what happens is you get slight compression of the bowl, or the flexible piece, where where with this with this that isn't even necessary. So. Almost there. <laughs> Okay, we're right at the good stage now. Uh, took off a little bit more than I needed to, but it'll work for this damn chuck. Okay, um, what I did there was because this jam is a little bit light on tightness. What I was doing was using the bevel of the, of the, uh, of the hole gouge to hold the, the jam. 
get a little vibration and this thing tends to come loose. And if you use the bevel of the bowl gouge to, to pull, and you can uh, finish the bottom surface and put the, put the finish on it. So that's how the bottom surface gets done. Bowl. Okay, so we did the jam chuck, we refined the profile of the base so that it's now hollow. And now we can put the ring with the jam chuck, with the lid. You can see that that's a nice little box. <laughs> Sorry, I apologize for, <laughs> I apologize, but you didn't know that you could make yourself a pretty good watch around this. So thank you all for your attention. I appreciate it. <laughs>